I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, welcome to our final panel in the Democracy and Informed Citizen series, Humanities in the Media. With that, I would like to acknowledge our funders for this project uh, that this program is a part of, it is a part of the Democracy and in the Informed Citizen Initiative, which is administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. This initiative seeks to deepen the public's knowledge and appreciation of the vital connections between democracy, the humanities, journalism, and informed citizenry. When you all popped in, uh, there was a little notice that this meeting's being recorded, and that is because we are uploading all of these videos to our YouTube channel, so you can come back and visit them later, or for folks who were unable to make it tonight, they can watch it later. As of now, we have Media Literacy Parts 1 and 2 up on our YouTube channel, and Part 3 about elections and political news coverage will be up in the coming weeks. And now to introduce our esteemed panelists, I would love to thank all of you for being here and agreeing to talk about multimedia journalism and what that means in today's world and how that relates to democracy. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Terrence Armstrong. He serves as a faculty advisor for A-State Society of Professional Journalists, A-State Photography Club, and Di Delta Digital News Service, a student-run online news service. He also currently teaches journalism, multimedia journalism, photojournalism, digital photography, desktop publishing, and publication design courses in the multimedia journalism and creative media programs in the School of Media and Journalism at Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. Next, we have Roby Brock. He is the CEO of Talk Business and Politics, a 23-year-old multimedia news organization reporting on business and politics in Arkansas. His company provides news coverage from four bureaus across the state, Little Rock, Northwest Arkansas, Jonesboro, and Fort Smith. Talk Business and Politics produces content on TV, radio, print, online, and through social media. And last but certainly not least, we have Jenny Diaz. She is the founder and executive director for Four Arkansas People, where she works daily to connect the dots between policy and people's lives and empower Arkansans to take ownership of their government. So if you all join me in welcoming our guests, I'm very excited for this evening's conversation. Um, just to kind of start off, could each of you just tell us a little bit more about yourselves, your work, and how you view your role when it comes to presenting news and media coverage? And we'll start out with Terrence and then going forward, we can just popcorn. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm Terrence and you know, for the most part, uh, as an educator, I see myself, you know, not necessarily uh, as a teacher, but more as a coach, you know, coming from a newsroom, I think, uh, I think that's been the biggest challenge is, okay, uh, learning whether, you know, I'm a teacher and understanding not just the content of what I'm teaching, uh, but more so really what I brought to the classroom was, okay, I'm more of a coach, and I think that's kind of helped out a lot of my students a bit. So I would call my role as a uh, more of a coach. I'm a coach and I try and help uh, student journalists be the best journalists they can be. And I, I, I really emphasize that when it comes to coaching because I see myself as an assistant and as a helper to those who wanna do the job as professional as possible before they actually get out there into the mainstream wor uh, world. But for the most part, uh, I teach journalism, I coach uh, primarily. And for the most part, I think I've helped students understand the industry, the various industries uh, in which journalism is utilized. And that is something that uh, I kind of, I don't, it's not that I pride myself in it, but I think when they have that understanding of the various industries, they get a broader understanding of how journalism is actually uh, utilized throughout the world and not just locally, but I mean, literally on a global scale. So yeah, you know, I try and bring understanding. I try and be a good coach and a really good friend. All right, Jenny, why don't you go next? Yeah, happy to. Um, so thanks, Jamie, for having me. Um, as she mentioned in my bio, um, I'm the director of 4 Air People. And 4AR People is a nonprofit and a nonpartisan organization um, 
centered around digital communications and digital media, where we connect the dots between policy here at the state level and then how it impacts our Kansans lives. Um, and we utilize news and media um, by creating um, paths uh, via news and media for, for folks to take ownership of state democracy, for them to feel empowered and be part of the democratic process here in our state um, and also at the local level, um, whether it's you know municipal involvement or county involvement. Um, we also do some work, some um, opposition research work and also um, accountability reporting on state leaders. Um, and we also do some organizing. We do some um, grassroots driven advocacy work that hopefully moves our state forward to be more equitable and balanced um, and more representative of, of what our state looks like. And Terrence, I don't know if you feel this way, but I think if Room Raider was grading us, I think Jenny gets a 10 out of 10 on that background there. I mean, I got to step up my game, I think a <laughs> lot. So uh, uh, my name's Roby Brock, as was indicated, and uh, I've been um, covering politics for 30 years, or I've been either involved in politics or covering politics for 30 years. So I kind of started by cutting my teeth in uh, working at the state capitol in a presidential campaign, in uh, a gubernatorial administration, and then on a bunch of campaigns, issues, as well as candidates. And I've been a candidate uh, myself for office, so I've kind of seen all of the different uh, ways that uh, you can kind of enter and serve in politics. And that has been a pretty good foundation for me as I have transitioned into uh, being a reporter of, of politics and business. Um, so I kind of, I've got a very unorthodox way of how I kind of got into all of this. I'm actually an English major that studied business at Hendricks College. And <clears throat> I guess 23 years ago, I started a video production company and it's difficult to kind of make ends meet. And so I had a bunch of background in politics and a bunch of background in business. And I was like, you know, nobody covers business and politics except in print. That's it. Why don't we put a TV show on that covers business and politics? I have a video production company. I can do that. Um, I actually pitched that to Arkansas Business first, and they passed on it. So I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And here I am 23 years later. So, And it's morphed and evolved because of uh, the television side of it. it produced a lot of on-camera interviews, and then that translated to radio, wanting some of those interviews. I've partnered with a lot of the public radio stations in the state over the years, uh, we did. We have done print products. We, uh, in the course of that 23 years, um, the internet blew up, and now all of a sudden you could do your own content management. And so we got into producing our own website, and then through social media and email and all these other different ways, we've cobbled together all these different paths to distribute the news that we curate and report on a daily basis. And we build content partnerships in the part in the wake of all of that. So kind of to Jenny and to Terrence's uh, perspectives, I mean, we, we, we come at business and politics and where they intersect, which is typically policy. So I'm not trying to, I, I like to joke around, we don't cover car wrecks and rednecks. We, we really cover, although the legislature could be moving that direction a little bit. So no, I'm just kidding. Um, but <laughs> But we do cover, I think, things that impact people's lives in a much more dramatic and broader way. And that's that's where we spend most of our time. So do we get off that path occasionally? We do, because that's where politics takes us uh, sometimes. But um, but for the most part, we try to stay in that intersection of business and politics there. And so we've just morphed over the years. Um, as Terrence kind of indicated on the business side of things, I've kind of looked at how things have evolved and we've just kind of transitioned with it by watching market forces. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later on. So, but it's been a good ride, but it's not been one that I mapped out or planned out or had a, you know, life plan or business plan for. It's just, it's kind of evolved. And now I do have a life and a business plan for it. So happy to be here tonight and thankful for our panelists joining uh, me and for all the guests that are here too. Awesome. Thank you all for those introductions. And so to kind of jump into the kind of the more meaty parts of our conversation. Um, just kind of with the ever evolving state of media and the different ways that we receive news and coverage, um, how are each of you working to kind of create more nuance and transparency or what kind of challenges are you facing in that mission? I can 
jump in on this one first. Um, so I mentioned that we do some accountability work with elected leaders. Um, transparency is really central to our work. Um, I would argue that our state government operates um, kind of from a standpoint of performative transparency. Um, that's my opinion. Um, but really, the way things happen in our state, it, it feels like it's incumbent upon the individual to seek out ways in which to be active in, in state government participation. Um, and I will say that we we do have a few mechanisms through which people can can take part. Um, an example of that would be like our state legislature live streaming, um, you know, chamber meetings or committee meetings. Um, but really, there are limited ways that people can participate in the process, especially if they live outside of Little Rock or if they have work obligations during kind of traditional work hours when the legislature is in session or in meetings, um, which I would feel like most people, um, you know, they don't have that flexibility to be able to log on and, and watch something happen when policy is being crafted that might impact them. So um, we try really hard to provide these on ramps for participation by bridging that gap and and how people can participate. We view that as a transparency issue. Um, and we use online communication for all of that. I mean, that's the, the primary avenue through which we do all of our work. Um, because most people are connected, you know, via their phones or their laptops um, or whatever it is, the ways in which they interact digitally, um, that allows us to communicate with most people. Um, and because most people are on social media, um, we're able to communicate with them there as well. So it's imperative that we're able to use these channels to communicate in ways that are not only accessible, um, but also digestible. So um, we're committed to kind of breaking down that uh, any barrier that may exist um, for that participation element when it comes to communication. So if, you know, something is in legalese or legislative ease, if you will, um, breaking that down into simpler terms that people can understand, um, even explaining things that are procedural that people might not understand. So um, if we see a barrier to a regular Arkansan who wants to be informed or you know, maybe doesn't want to be informed, but we want to convince them that it's important to be informed, um, we're going to work towards that and we're going to leverage online communication to make that happen. So yeah, it's at the it's at the central part of what we do, and and hopefully through online communication and with the work of, um, you know, journalists who are committed to um, telling truth and and speaking truth as it pertains to our state, um, you know, and through the changing uh, landscape of digital media, we can beef up uh, the transparency with our state government. I'd like to add to what Jenny said, and then I can um, maybe even transition something for Terrence to jump in there on this too. First of all, I, when Robbie Wills was Speaker of the House, this is when the House of Representatives went to live streaming um, its committee meetings. And uh, those of us in the media at the time were very supportive of that. That was back in the late 2000s, I think, around 2009, maybe. Um, but I will tell you, I'm going to pat myself on the back and take some credit, Jenny. I pushed the Senate to do it. So it was me personally going down there is when Senator Jonathan Dismang was the leader of that chamber. And I said, I got a guy here that can make this work for you. He's He'll put a bid together for you, but you can outsource this bid to you know get some other people in there. And I think they wound up hiring somebody else besides the guy that I, I put in there. But it pushed them to do it. And that was very, very helpful. Um, so and I think that has helped transparency a lot in terms of letting people see what goes on, particularly at the state legislature. I think it does also equate to a lot of that performance art is what I call it, which is where you see the grandstanding and they know there's a camera on them. And um, this happened at the national level when C-SPAN went into Congress and all this. But you still get, I think, much more good than bad from this because you can obviously see some of the grandstanding that goes on and cut through that, but you also see a lot of policy in action. And so I think that's good. I, I take the transparency question another way too. You know, one of the things that we struggle with, we're an advertiser supported business model. Um, and so I walk a really thin tightrope quite often of I'm reporting and even interviewing people that are newsmakers for some of the companies <laughs> and politicians that you know, uh, sometimes I advertise on our program, 
<clears throat> or on any of our platforms. And so one of the things we're very careful to do is to, you know, we try to do as much separation as we can between sales and uh, and editorial content. And there's a, a wall there, but it, I, I can kind of straddle both because I have relationships in both of those areas. And so I think the attitude that I've always taken with that is I'm, I'm always going to report what I think is the news. Um, there's polite ways to ask difficult questions. You don't have to be a jerk about bad news. And I have found over 23 years that even I've never lost an advertiser because of the way that we covered news, um, because we've always been fair with them. We we have presented some bad news and many a times for some of our advertisers, but we've always given them the opportunity to put their side of the story on there. We've looked for the counter side of, to some of those stories when they've existed. Sometimes it's just bad financial news. Um, but we've always treated them fairly. And I think we've always treated them professionally. We've always, we've never been kind of one of those punch you in the face, interview style, um, aggressive uh, kind of media people in that way. And I think that that has served us well. And quite frankly, I think that that contributes to a much more cordial and um, productive kind of dialogue in, in politics. And we need more of that uh, this day and age. It's not as fun to watch, but it is, I think in the long run, it's, it's, it's what I think is where society needs to be. And I have found, I'm just, I'm not comfortable being a, you know, a, a jerk to someone, you know, so I'm just not going to do that. It's not my nature. Parents. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where, you know, on a local level, when I came to this, this, this city right here, the mayor, uh, the mayor actually had a show or the city government actually had a show in which they actually discussed policy and they would discuss the ongoings of the municipality and what was going on. Uh, I think the only thing uh, with that specific show was that, you know, it was only for the municipality. And so it wasn't it wasn't regional. And because of that, you, you only saw one dominant voice that was going on. And, I, I, and I'd almost be very cautious when it came when it comes to, you know, if we if if media, um, especially news media, specifically, if you go if you go into a situation where you're actually you're you're reporting and you're showing uh, public officials doing their business, which is great, great transparency. You know, yes, it should be done, but you know, you want to watch out for the Wizard of Oz syndrome, where you know you have the guy, you know, you see the wizard, but if you look behind the curtain, something else is going on. And so, yes, it's it's really good that you can bring that the cameras are allowed to go in there. You do have the opportunity to live stream. You know, our students they can you know you can watch government uh, meetings and you can watch city meetings, city council meetings, or quorum court meetings in some places, not all online and that's very good but this does not negate the fact that i would I, I would i would i would probably on every situation say that a journalist should still be there because they're going to give you the show and it's almost the questions that you don't see in the show that need to be asked and they're going to always be questions you know uh the problem with that oftentimes is that you know how do you manage this relationship because they they're still the gatekeepers in in, in in some situations you know in most situations you don't they can't negate the cameras being there you know they can allow the cameras to be there or they could say you know maybe you shouldn't be there but for the most part i would say you do have to balance your relationship because you know it was kind of like uh roby was saying earlier uh you know you don't you know you don't want to be difficult but maybe there's a time when you have to be but the difficult is defined by you know what do you how, how are they defining being difficult if you're asking them a question that's uncomfortable uh are they going to come back and say well you know you know we had you have your cameras in here last week we no longer want your cameras in here we're going to have you stand to the side as someone who's practiced photojournalism i've been there i've been there where okay when they like you open arms it's great come see what we're doing yeah, wait a minute, hold on. There's a situation with you and your money. We need to get photos. We need to ask you about that. And now they don't want to interview. And so, you know, you don't want to be difficult. You don't want to be uh, in the sense, and what I mean by difficult, you don't want to be rude, but you do want to be professional and you have to be aggressive in some situations and you can't let them off the hook. 
uh, you're always cordial. And so it's kind of like, you know, unfortunately, I, I, and I, I, I teach students. So I say, it's like Roadhouse, you be nice until it's time not to be nice, but you be nice. You know, it's just, it's, it's just what Patrick Swayze said, you be nice, you always be nice, you be nice, you be professional, but there is a time not to be nice. And you have to realize when they're giving you the dog and pony show, they want to give you a sound bite. That's not what you want. You want the answer to where those funds went. You want the answer to why did they vote this way? You want the answer to, you know, what are you going to do about the little old lady who's street, you know, the person who you've been avoiding, you know, the questions that make it difficult for government officials, they need to be asked. And that's what the public depends on. They depend on us to ask those questions. Uh, at the same time, it is, it's, it's, it, it can be difficult because you have to balance that relationship. And I think depending on how big and broad your newsroom is, sometimes you have to have two people. And I, you know that's kind of what I teach students here is that in sports, and forgive me for taking so long, but sports is a very good, I think it's a very good, uh, it's a very good example of this because you can have a sports reporter cover a game, but what happens if an athlete goes to jail? And oftentimes that's what students will often encounter hey, listen, I'm going to report on the game, but I have to ask this question about why this athlete was arrested. Now, is that is the SID going to stop us from, you know, covering the game? Is he going to make it difficult? Is he only going to give us one photo pass? Because these, these are real things. This happens. Students actually experience this. And these are all adults. They're students, but these people are, they're 18 and over, and they're experiencing this from adults who are, you know, in their 30s and their 40s. And so they experience a little bit of retaliation and I'm saying, hey, listen, don't sacrifice your sports reporter. Let's put someone else on it. And so there comes a, there, there, you, you end up getting into a strategy. You know, how do I handle this? <clears throat> After college, it's the same thing with City Hall. You know, you may, not, you may not want your government reporter or your metro reporter asking those hard questions. You may want the guy in the back who's been here 40 years, who's known as, you know, that guy who can do that. And so it does, it's almost a duality that I believe that news organizations have to have. Uh, and sometimes it is just that one person. Sometimes all you have is one person. Sometimes you, you're just a small place and you're a small outlet and you have to be nice and you have to be hard. You have to be salty. You have to be sweet, but you have to get the job done. And they have to trust that you're going to be fair because in the end, you know, that's going to lend to your credibility. Hey, listen, Roby was fair. <laughs> he was fair on this show. And so I believe when they say that you're fair, uh, that extends your credibility, even though the questions were difficult, uh, you were fair. And so, you know, in my opinion, I think that's what we have to always remember. Let's be fair. Uh, don't let them get away. Don't let them get away with the dog and pony show. Uh, the Wizard of Oz, look behind the curtain and say, hey, look, look at that, you know. Yeah. And, and let them know, hey, you know, we see this. We know this is going on. Talk to me about it, you know, with a smile on your face sometimes. <laughs> you know, unless it's one of those times when a smile shouldn't be on your face, uh, depending on what the issue is. Yeah. I can remember interviewing a, a U.S. senator who shall rename nameless. And um, I mean, I didn't get an answer to the question the first time, which was a pretty blunt, you know, direct question. I got the, the jibber jabber. So I, I basically just repeated the question again. I said, I didn't hear an answer to my question. My question was such and such, such and such. I got the same talking point again. Yeah. I said, I'm going to ask this one more time and probably a different way. And I asked the question again a third time and I still got the same, um, you know, answer. And I said, well, and I'm in a timed TV interview via satellites. I mean, this isn't like I've got a lot of, you know, uh, ability to pivot, you know, and, that, and we've wasted six minutes already with this. And I said, um, you know, it sounds like you're not going to answer my question that I've asked, so let's move on. And so I've, I'm obviously stating to the viewer, listener, reader, you heard him. He didn't answer the question. I've asked the question three times. I'm not getting an answer to the question, but it was diplomatic. It was fair. But at the same time, I was pointing out you didn't answer the question. So um you know, and sometimes that's the best you can do. You know, and one of those, if you don't mind, and and one of, and 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 because you're you're in broadcast television, you know, in a situation like that, I would have told my reporters, you know what, 
we're putting that in a we're putting that in a breakout box on one A. The fact that you asked that question and there was no answer. Yeah. And that's something you can do with print that you can't, you know, you can't and and these are the different advantages to having different con- media conduits, right? So you have broadcast radio, you have broadcast television, you have, you know, you have print, you have newspaper, you have magazine. And I think that's when you have to look at the medium you're in and say, you know what, you know, that really irritated me. And so maybe, you know, Roby, uh, you know, you you certainly did your job, but then if there was an online story, you know, I don't, yeah. th- I don't know if you write the online stories for yeah, us. Yeah, we do. And it was Senator Avoid's Answer exactly and, and that's how you so, yeah, get, yeah and right. that's how you get and that and yeah, exactly and that's how you come around that you know because it is it you know you're playing chess with humans and you're using journalism and you know they're trying to avoid it and you're trying to counteract them you know and yeah. and, and it's not a matter of playing gotcha i can't remember what this topic was at the time but it was a relevant question of news of the day that a senator should have a position on i was not asking a a question that wasn't predicted to be coming up in this interview. And so the fact that there was this avoidance of it was just crystal clear to anybody that was paying attention there. Jenny, I think I might've cut you off a little earlier there. Sorry about that. So. Oh, no, I was I was just commenting on, on Roadhouse being kind of the ethos of <laughs> good journalism. That, that felt right. All right. Um, thank you all for that. We've talked a little bit about various forms of multimedia journalism. Uh, A new and up and coming, or not up and coming, it's taken over a lot of where people get their news. Is there a place for social media in the field of journalism? What are the pros? What are the cons to that medium? Wow. Go Uh, Jenny. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we, well, um, yeah, it's, I don't think we can deny that there's a a place for it. Uh, For us in particular, it's, it's absolutely critical, critical to our work. I mean, we're not broadcast journalists, we're not print journalists. So, um, you know, again, like we exist in that fluid virtual space. um, So we have to, to leverage social media. Um, You know, we view it as a modern town square of sorts where people exchange ideas. um, And I don't see us moving away from it. Um, Of course, there are cons. um, And I think chief among them is misinformation or disinformation. So, you know, being able to distinguish an entity as credible, um, as a credible source, you, how do you cut through the heavily trafficked noise of bad information that seems to persist? Um, and, and I think that there are some channels, some, some social media channels that do have guardrails in place that others don't. And I, you know, a great example of this is Twitter, as we all know, you know, when Elon Musk took over, he kind of stripped it down, stripped it of its, um, standards of practice regarding disinformation. And now we, we don't really know what the impact of that will be on news and journalism and information, um, for us in particular, we're not strictly a journalistic site. We we do a lot of that advocacy work and again, a lot of that action-oriented content production. Um, but we rely on good on really good journalism um, to create those action items and to shape our advocacy work. So, you know, we, we need really robust um truth-based journalism for us to be able to do our work, for us to be able to succeed. Um, and, you know, I am pleased that we have kind of added to the the voice of, of state-driven journalism. I know recently um, with the creation of the Arkansas Advocate, the um, new Arkansas affiliate of State's Newsroom, that was a really welcome um, thing for us to, to hear about because we, it's just another uh, mouthpiece to tell the truth about what's happening here in our state. So, um, you know, we we rely on that. We we need people to do the hard work of journalism. We need them to do it in the social media sphere because um, if we don't, um, we're we're going to continue to be threatened by misinformation. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, that is you know social media. Oh my goodness, especially being in a journalism program, I can tell you the impact of social media. Uh, if I hear TikTok one more time, I swear I'm gonna explode. Uh, 
and and I am I'm I'm getting kind of weathered in my age when it comes to journalism because I'm dealing with a generation now. They're young enough to, you know, they're the same age as my kids. However, here's the thing about journalism. And I kind of give students this scenario. New York Times, New York Post, you know, and when I when I came here, a lot of students didn't understand what a tabloid was. And I think that's extremely important when you study journalism. You need to understand what tabloids are. And you need to understand their place in journalism. They do have a place. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. And so when you have social media, uh, you have various types of social media. They do different things. So yes, you do have your Twitter. You have your Facebook. You have your TikTok. And, and they have different these things. They have different roles when they actually convey information. So what is Instagram you know, mostly good for? What is Twitter mostly good for? What is Facebook mostly good for? And how, as a news outlet or a a news source, how do we actually use that to the best of our abilities? I think that, you know, number one, timing, information, as far as timing when the news goes out, uh, which one should be, should we jump to immediate? You know, if something happens, you know, does it go out over Twitter? you know, uh, should it go out? It, does it accompany photos? Is it most? Is it mostly visual imagery? Should it be on Instagram? If you put it on Instagram, uh, are people are more people going to see it there, or should there be a photo on Facebook that connects it to Instagram? So, what we're doing is we're connecting. What we're doing is we're building. It's a recipe, really. It's a social media recipe, especially when a story breaks. And the way we, the way I used to do it back then was like, okay. We got a story, time it so that it goes out on Twitter and time it so that it goes out on Facebook. And at a certain time too, especially if this is a daily newspaper, because it's important that it goes out before five when those people wake up, those people of a certain age wake up and they get their morning coffee. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a global world now and people are waking up all over the world. And I watch news all over the world. I watch NHK. Uh, Coming to Jonesboro is one of the best things I did because I get a chance to look at news in Japan. And I watch news in Japan every morning. And so having said that, I have a lot of students who, uh, well, I had a few students who were in my program from Japan. And my thing in telling them, and and here at Delta Digital News Service, the person who's actually over our social media is Japanese. And so what I taught her is, hey, listen, I need you to look at news on a global scale. Look at it locally. Look at it statewide. Look at it regionally within the states. And then look at it on a national and on a global scale and see what impacts what, you know, is this relevant to, to us and if we can use it. And it's a very, very small world, you know, things that happen, you know, FIFA, what's going on now, that's very pertinent, especially at a university, considering the, um, the demographics of the students who are here. You know, a lot of people are talking about FIFA, not everyone, of course, we still have American football. But the reality is, is that that's important. That needs to be understood. You have politics that's going on that needs to be understood. And so her thing is she needs to decipher through all of this and still make room for, hey, there's a guy that got shot last night at the liquor store. There was a car wreck, maybe with a redneck. (laughs) Remember that? That was important on a local scale. That really was important because, you know, uh, that car wreck may have been, you know, someone that was relevant or in a place that was relevant. So social media becomes that it becomes, you know, it can be a it can be a weapon. It really can. It could be like having a superpower uh, if it's used correctly. But when it's not used correctly, it ends up it can be it can be a distraction. It ends up being like just another form of enter- entertainment. And I've seen where sometimes maybe certain journalism professors have a time, okay, how do we use this TikTok? Uh, do we make do we make songs? Do we do a song and dance? And I'm like, I don't think you need to be doing the song and dance. You're going to end up more into the tabloid section as opposed to the news section. New York Times, New York Post, which one you want to be at this moment, you know, make a decision. And so uh, I think you, you it's important. It's extremely important. Uh, at the same time, it, it is kind of like having, you know, it's kind of like a, a five year old with the powers of Superman. You got to be careful. Yes, you can get the cookies or you can jump high and go to the moon and you have to balance that, you know, I mean, that's that's the way I see it, but it is necessary. It really is necessary. And there are so many of them out there. I don't think they're all necessary, though. I don't think uh, I don't think you need to be on every last one of them. I don't. 
Uh, and I've seen where I remember be, uh, a newspaper was struggling, like, okay, we need to be here. We need, I'm like, why do you think you need to be there? Why do you, what, where, what part of your, your audience and your public is on there? Okay. Is it, and, and could this simply be just a fad that's passing? You know, and that's something that's relevant. I don't think Facebook is a fad. I, I certainly Twitter isn't. I mean, obviously, and you have your staples, but then you have the others that are, you know, they're 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 they may be timely novelties that pass with the time, but they're relevant for the moment. And so I think you have to be keen and you have to use them. You know, it's almost like you have to be a horse whisperer because there's so many social media programs out there. You have to be a social media whisperer, like okay you can I tame you and is it going to cause more trouble than good so there are a lot of questions that should be asked but as news media specifically as we write stories as we take photos as we do video where do we place this at because they're they're, they're going to go on our site you know but how do we link back to the story how many hits is the story going to get so I can jack up well not jack up the advertising but get as much advertising as possible Right, because you can't talk about it unless you talk about advertising. So you know, how do I, how do I, basically monetize this as much as as much as I can? But the goal, of course, isn't monetization. The goal is we want to produce the news. But once again, you know, we go back to, you know, what pays the bills. It's extremely important. You know, it's extremely important. I think that the, the, I mean, first of all, social media is an important, um, and I'm lumping a lot of stuff into that, but it's an important stream for news and for people to get their news, for people to curate their news, for people to follow what's going on in the world. We, um, to Terrence's point, we, we typically, we've, we've experimented with some other stuff before and it, and when it doesn't reach an audience that we're trying to reach, that we wanted it to reach, if we don't, I think it's got that level of breakthrough yet. It's not something that we've we've uh, we've stayed with. Like for instance, we've tried podcasting before, and we just didn't find a big audience for podcasting. Um, business and political leaders are not going to be really big on TikTok, so I really don't think I have to worry about that anytime uh, soon, unless we start wanting to capture the under nineteen audience that will eventually be in mainstream adulthood, and we will be interested in them there. But the um, but how I kind of view social media is is a pretty much a twofold deal, and it's not really that much different than traditional media going back through history. You've got the the news production companies, which used to just be three big TV stations that did all of the national news. Then you got into the you know the cable channels twenty four seven. You used to just have newspapers. Now you've got all kinds of smaller news outlets that that all popped up. There's a responsibility from those news outlets to produce news in a responsible way. And distributing that through social media is no different than distributing it through a newspaper in print. It's not any different than distributing it through the airwaves for radio or for television. You still have a responsibility to produce that news in a, in a way that is responsible to the people that you're, you're pushing that news to. So there's that camp of people in social media that have that responsibility to, to be serious about what they're providing and not untruthful. And then I think it's just, um, again, you can pick which TV stations you want to watch. You can pick which radio stations you want to listen to. You can pick which newspapers you want to read. Um, you got to do that same thing as a consumer of news if you're going to use social media channels to do that. You got to go with somebody that you trust. You got to go with people that you trust, with news sources that you trust, so that you're not getting so much misinformation in your feeds that you're you've got some sort of different view of the world. And that and that's where I think a big breakdown is for social media is because it is easy to get trapped in that echo chamber of news. Um, but I think some of those folks that maybe have fallen into that trap would say, "Well, we used to be that way when there were just three big TV networks and there was one dominant." you know, statewide newspaper, and there wasn't a lot of other voices out there. Now there's more voices, but it's, there's the responsibility on the news provider side. And then I think there's a responsibility from the news consumer to make sure that they're, they're not being misled. They have, there has to be some degree of participation in your education um, of what you're consuming for social media to be a positive for you. I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you all for that. Um, 
Before we go into our final question for this evening, is there anything you would like the folks at home to know? Is there any one thing about this conversation we're having you want to like drive home for people? Yeah, I would probably say something Something Roby said made me think of uh, the fact that you do have a responsibility for what you digest news-wise. Having said that, uh, I've met people, I've talked to people, and i talk to a lot of people, and I do a lot of talking. And one of the things where were people, and when I came here, I've only been here three years, and I found it very difficult for students as well as the average public to actually really figure out and decipher the difference between someone who's a journalist and, a dif and the difference between someone who's simply a commentator of news. You have journalists and you have commentators of news. Now you have commentators who were in the road as a journalist at one point in their life and now who have shows. They have journalists working for them oftentimes, but as commentators, they give their opinion. And this is where we kind of get that, okay, hey, listen, is this, is this program more liberal? Is it more conservative? And, and what you end up having is you end up having a polarization of the public. Well, I don't watch that. You know, they, it doesn't align with my political beliefs. It doesn't align with, you know, what, what I believe. And I think that recognizing, hey, listen, this person is not operating as a journalist uh, when they make these comments or really when, when this show is not a journalism show. It employs journalists. A lot of times the journalists are sitting in back of them and they're actually doing the research and they're actually writing the stories. And so it's one of those things and primarily, you know, not to denigrate CNN, but, you know, we have, you know, we watch them all here. We watch CNN, MSNBC, we watch Fox. We certainly watch LinkedIn TV. We watch, you know, I get students to watch as much as possible and listen, especially democracy now. You need to listen, you need to pay attention Look at, listen to how it's being delivered and listen to word usage. You know, this, this, this becomes important because once you start following people, and this, this is where we, you know, once you start following people, they're going to either reinforce a lot of times what you believe, or they're not going to reinforce what you believe. And they're going to educate you on something, whether or not you receive that new information that you've been educated on, it's totally up to you. So having said that, you know, one of the things I do is uh, I tell students, hey, listen, follow 100 journalists. And that's really easy because that's 20 news outlets, five journalists each. And you pick them uh, and, and pick some of the ones maybe you don't like, but not ones that are just way biased and, and see if you can kind of feel a balance in what the statement is as far as, you know, what they're reporting on, because there are things that do not get reported. I do this exercise with my students. I say, hey, look at this story here. This is a solid story. You have not seen that story on CNN in the last 72 hours. You have not seen it here on the MSNBC. And I think that's important. So yes, you, you certainly have to follow. It's certainly your responsibility, uh, but you can choose. That's the beauty of social media. You can choose who you wanna follow. And, and that truly is the beauty of social media because if you don't wanna follow, I don't know, Chris Cuomo, I follow Chris Cuomo, but if you don't wanna follow Chris Cuomo, you know what? You can delete. I don't follow him no more. He's with News Nation now. You know, if you don't want to follow Don Lemon, if you don't want to follow, you know, uh, a lot of the other journalists don't. But follow your local journalists, follow your state, follow your national and some, you know, a lot of and follow them through all all different aspects of the uh, of the media rainbow. And I think, you know, you'll you'll get not only informed, but I think you will create pretty much a synthesis of where you actually feel a balance, where you're actually being educated the way you need to be honest. I think you will. Yeah. Can I take this question in queue that's right here? Yes. Um, I'll go ahead and read it out. So okay. we have it for the record. Uh, Haley asked, Roby mentioned the responsibility of journalists to be honest and to have certain standards, including on social media. And I'm curious if there's any accountability for journalists in this age of misinformation, disinformation, or since we are living in a capitalistic world, is it just who gets the clicks and the likes so they keep going with the misinformation, if that's what people want to read? Does this question make sense? Basically, who holds journalists accountable for incorrect reporting, if anybody? Yeah, I think your question makes sense, uh, Haley. So 
Um, so a couple things I would say about that. I, it's the responsibility of the journalists to be honest and um, accurate as they can be about what they're reporting, because the only thing that a journalist has is credibility. And if you lose your credibility with the audience that you've either built or are trying to build, they're not going to believe you when you report the 99 out of 100 other stories that you're supposed to be providing to them on a daily basis. So to me, the accountability is a personal one. It's get it right, be accurate about it. If you make a mistake, own the mistake and put out there that you made a mistake. Um, but um, so I think it's the journalist that's responsible for not doing the things that are mis misinforming the public. And I see a lot of intentional misinforming in the public in some of the commentators that Terrence is talking about. Uh, from some politicians that have, you know, certain agendas. Um, and quite frankly, you know, I'm not going to say a lot of journalists, but there are some journalists that do come at things from a certain perspective. Um, and they typically are with um, less mainstream publications or media organizations, but they'll come at stuff with a slant. And I guess I'm just trained enough to have kind of observe a lot of that or have questions about it when I see it, but I don't think that everybody else is. So the responsibility to me is on the journalist. Um, on in terms of the capitalistic world and the you know desire to get all the clicks, I have this conversation with my journalists a lot because we we might have a story that goes. I mean, we had a story that got over a hundred thousand views one time, which was huge uh, for a Arkansas-based news report. And then we'll have some that might get one hundred and sixty-two views. And uh, my journalists, my reporters that get the one hundred and sixty-two views on a story, will say. Man, that was, a ter I guess that was a terrible story. I'm like, it wasn't a terrible story. I said, our brand is to provide business and political news to a very wide audience of people um, and to provide it in a credible way. And that story was credible and true to our mission. And it was part of the daily news cycle and it needed to be reported. And so over time, if I've got 30 stories in a month to get 162 clicks on it, I'm fulfilling my mission of providing what I think is the relevant news information to that 162 people that read that story each time. That 162 people is an important part of our audience, um, and it's an important part of our credibility as a brand. And so I don't worry about the clicks on that. Um, it's great when one goes viral. And we joke about it, you know, it's like, why did that go viral? I mean, they, you know, some story will get 20,000 or 30,000 views. It's like, a, a, you know, a, a breakfast restaurants coming to Bentonville. It's like 30,000 people cared that, you know, the broken egg was coming to Benton. whatever, you know, we will have done three stories that day on a debate at the legislature, some breaking news from J.B. Hunt, and, you know, something happened in, uh, at, at the governor's press conference, and it's the broken egg, it's the big views. It does not make us go out and do more stories on the broken egg. It makes us just say it was a business story, it popped, it is what it is, who knows, maybe we're the first ones to get it out there, and so it kind of caught wind, but we stay true to that mission uh, and don't worry about those clicks. And I have a lot of talks with my journalists about that a lot because it's that's important to our brand is to make sure that we're providing relevant content daily. Um, I'd like to pop in. Well, first of all, Roby, people are hungry and we love breakfast. So <laughs> I'm not to me at all. Um, yeah, I, two things. I Christina asked a question and I, I would like to answer that in a second. But first you asked... Um, Jamie, about, you know, implore, if, if we could leave the audience with one thing um, from tonight. For me personally, be, because all of our work is, is state-centered and kind of homegrown, Arkansas-based um, advocacy work and communication, um, I would just implore um, people who watch this and um, are on the call now to, um, to follow and be involved in local journalism um, at, at the city level and the county level and also at the state level. Um, I think what, what we tend to scream into the wind about and with our organization is how much state policy matters to people's everyday lives. And unfortunately, because of the impact of, of digital communications and misinformation, um, you know, we have seen uh, kind of partisan rhetoric um, 
really just explode over the last decade or so. And that has shaped people's engagement levels um, when it comes to civic participation. And I, I know that this series um, is centered around an informed citizenry. So um, when we in, when we do a good job of informing the citizenry or as individuals, as our Kansans, um, being responsible consumers of that information and seeking it out from a, from a place of responsibility, um, we're able to become empowered and engaged uh, members of our democracy. And that is all the first step in, in really shaping uh, a robust, healthy democracy at the state level and the national level. Um, and so I would just say, you, everybody cares about something. <laughs> you, you know, even if you care only about the weather and sports, there are great journalists who cover the weather and sports um, at your local level and at your state level. There's always something that you can learn about. And if you have the right perspective, that can, um, you know, not shape necessarily your political views, but help you to see how you can become part of solutions that you may, um, you know, have if you, if you have frustrations and you have issues or, um, hopes, dreams, fears, like whatever you're lying awake at night thinking about instead of falling asleep, um, get involved and, and make journalism and news locally part of that. And, and I, I do think that will give, that will enable people to feel empowered and to feel hopeful. Um, because I know that a lot of people don't feel that way, um, about, politics or about, um, civic participation. Um, I think people probably just like, you know, roll their eyes, not, not Roby's audience. He's, he's got the, I the get edge of people rolls, who are engaged. I get plenty of eye rolls. Trust me, so. <laughs> um, and, and to Christina's question, um, she asks if, you know, since credibility is central to success in, in journalism, um, how can the tide be turned from acceptance of journalists without credibility? And this is just a personal, um, uh, kind of a personal motto of mine it, and, and what we do within our organization is we don't amplify. Um, however salacious it might be and kind of that kind of reprogramming we've all experienced as consumers of digital media for the last 20 plus years, we have this tendency to want to wade in. Um, you know, I, there was some hubbub today as probably a lot of us know about the governor elects wardrobe cho choice um, at one of, I'm sure the many pressers Roby has attended in the last couple of days. Um, and there's this compelling sense of like, I've got to add my voice to this conversation. I need to be part of this. This is part of like the town square and everybody's going nuts about it. But if something is not credible and we know we have that gut check that it's not credible, we should not be amplifying it because that just feeds into the big data algorithm, you know, ecosystem. And then that just gets shown more frequently. And we're just continuing to amplify that noise and that traffic that doesn't need to be there. So that's kind of my motto. I don't really know how we solve that problem from a bigger perspective, but, but that's kind of what I do. It, it's a tide that's not going to turn quickly or easily is part of the problem too. It's just not something you can snap your fingers and change because there's just so much that has been at work in terms of brainwashing some people to get to that point that that they will accept these types of lacking in credibility um, stories. I think not amplifying is great advice uh, from Jenny there, and that's something we work hard not to do too. We we pass on stories sometimes. I mean, you didn't see us doing a story on Sarah Huckabee Sanders' wardrobe because that's not a story. Um, quite frankly, it was pretty sexist what went out there, and and sad in my realm. That's really not what that press conference was about yesterday. It's not what the questions were about yesterday. So, um, you know, we never commented on Asa Hutchinson's wardrobe. Why, why would we, I don't care what she wears, to be honest with you. I care about what her policies are. I care about what she plans to do for the state of Arkansas. So that's where uh, we kind of keep our focus, but not amplifying, I think is good. And I think you know, pointing out to the people that you can be influential with that this is not accurate, this is not credible, is also really important. In your circle of trust, somebody has to hear from people that they value uh, opinions from. It may be a small circle, it may be a big circle, I don't know. I I'll give you a great example. In the 2016 presidential campaign, uh, you'll, you might remember Hillary Clinton's running mate was Tim Kaine, senator from Virginia. Uh, my wife 
uh, Facebook page, she was showing me these women that she's friends with uh, from an affluent families in West Little Rock, well-educated, um, high income, smart people, and people doing well in life. Probably weren't going to vote for Hillary Clinton if you just take the, you know, Republican profile with these folks. But they had put a, this one lady had put a Facebook post out that said, I could never support Hillary Clinton for picking this man, Tim Kaine, after the way he treated his daughter. And it was a story from something like CNN.MSNBC.FoxNews.com. I mean, it was like this made up news organization, number one. When I looked at it immediately, I was like, that's not even a news organization. I'll Google it to make sure, but I'm, I'm certain of that. But it was a story about Tim Kaine cussing for 10 minutes in some recording uh, his daughter uh, for a million different things. And I'm scratching my head. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure this would be a national news story by now if this was true. And it's just from this one source on this one lady's Facebook page. And mind you, there's other people chiming in on this. Oh, my gosh, this is horrible. Oh, I'm with you 100 percent. I do. A, it struck a nerve with me. I was like, I know this is something. So I Google real quick an instinct I have, and it turns out it was the Alec Baldwin audio from when he got caught by his wife or his wife's attorney many years ago berating his daughter, and it was released publicly on like TMZ or something like that. It, it was the exact same. I mean, they just basically, somebody lifted it, put it in a fake news site, and said, this is, this is the way Tim Kaine treats his children. And these people picked up on it. And so I put in the post, I mean, I know several of these people. I'm like, this, this is not real news. The, here's where this news originates. It did not stop that thread from continuing. They went on and on and on and on and on as if I had not even posted a story or a, a comment in there. And I'm like, wow. So, I mean, it's just, that's how hard it is to break that cycle. And so to, to, de-emphasize journalists that don't have credibility. It's not a one-time calling them out thing. It's a consistent calling them out and, and, and talking to those people that you have some influence on. Um, and again, not amplifying it by spreading it around more and, and adding more fuel to the fire, but, but trying to, at least with the people you think you can be influential with. And I thought I had some influence with those people, but clearly I did not, so. All right. Oh, Terrence, did you have something to add? Uh, I was, you know, I was reading the comments and uh, the bottom part of one comment and the rest of the comment. And, you know, it says, uh, or since we live in a capitalistic world, is it just we get the clicks and likes so they keep going with the information? If that's what people want to read, does the question make sense? Basically, we hold journalists accountable for incorrect reporting, if anybody. And then the next one, I agree with credibility and central, is central to all successful journalists. How can a tie be turned from acceptance of journalists without credibility? And I want to say the most important, the, the most important thing that came out and stuck out is this right here. The public holds us accountable. The public. And so oftentimes when I speak to people, especially, especially, you know, I'm gonna jump on small town newspapers just for a second, <laughs> but just, just just for a little bit. So listen. You know, I often ask the public, you know, where were you? Do you? First of all, do you subscribe to your local newspaper? Do you? Okay. Okay, because if you do not, then let's put that right there to the side right there. So you don't subscribe to your local newspaper. Maybe you should. Maybe you should participate. There are letters to the editor. Maybe you should write a letter to the editor when you read a story you don't agree with or you see a tweet you don't agree with. Maybe you should participate. Okay, hey. We all know newspapers, a lot of these news media models from, from television shows, they're meant to make, yes, they are businesses. They, they make a profit. Yes, they utilize journalism. Yes, they do make a profit. It is a capitalistic society. And yes, they must make money in order to continue. But the reality is, is that that doesn't mean you don't engage. You know, you, unless you're going to leave America, okay, you're not going to leave capitalism. Okay, let's just be... Let's just get that on the table. So you're not leaving capitalism. So then how do you engage? Participate, subscribe, watch, communicate. If you don't like what Roby is saying on his show, send him a letter. You know, with newspapers and going back to small town, there's, a, there's typically most have letters to the editor. Write a letter, engage. 
you know, engage because I was used to getting letters at my newspaper. Some were just, look, I appreciate people engaging because I knew a lot of these people subscribed. The worst thing you can get is someone who doesn't subscribe and wants to engage. And that happened to me one time when a guy wanted to criticize the demographic of the people who were on the front page of the paper. And unfortunately, this was a person who was the same ethnic group as I was. And so I was called back to the news me to the newsroom and was asked to, you know, hey, can you speak to this guy and let him know that, you know, and, and my first question was like, uh, what's wrong, sir? He was like, yeah, I'm tired of these photos uh, showing people digging in ditches. I'm like, oh, really? I knew exactly what the issue was, because my next question was like, OK, you didn't see Monday's edition because Monday showed a person same ethnic group in a suit giving a speech. And not only that, my next question was, do you subscribe to the paper? And he didn't. And I say, hey, why don't you subscribe? What, what's stopping you? You can afford it. What's stopping you? Engage. Hold us accountable. But hold us accountable when we need to be held accountable. Don't hold us accountable because we do something you don't like. You know, And that's where, that's where a lot of the entertainment you see in journalism is coming from because that's where a lot of the news is. It's more than sensationalism. It's more going toward entertainment. And that's my fear with the younger generation, the, the TikTokers and the uh, millennials is that if it's not entertaining, they're not gonna engage. And that scares me because I'm like, oh my goodness, these, you know, please read this story. The, the, the hardest thing I have with students is getting them to read, literally getting them to read. They wanna watch and they wanna listen and they want a nice little tune and they want bells and whistles. And I'm like, hey, did you, did you read that story? I, you know, no, they want to listen to someone say it to them. Listen, you have to engage. You have to engage fully. Uh, I mean, if you like democracy, you do. You, you have to engage. Uh, otherwise, you know, th this could end really quickly. And I think you guys know this, this, this democratic experiment we call the United States of America. If, if news and journalists go under and become demonized like we have been in the last, I don't know how many years, uh, it, it, it could end real fast because a lot of the big companies, not like this gentleman right here, Roby, who has his own business, but the, a lot of the big companies, the ones that are out for stock and are out to make money, they're going to give you the entertainment. They're going to give you the sensationalism. They're going to give you, oh, listen, let's give them biased news. Let's give them news that's completely one-sided or that's extremely liberal or extremely conservative. They're going to give it to you as long as they're, as, as long as they're, the audience is increasing that likes it. And where the audience is increasing and the views are there, the advertising is going to go because ads are there. I mean, you, you have to understand the business aspect of it. Uh, I, I think as a journalist, you do. As, a, as someone who's a, who's a regular uh, consumer of news, I think you should. We all watch the Super Bowl. We all know how important the Super Bowl is and we watch those ads and we know how much they pay for those ads, right? If we don't, we should by now. They pay a lot of money. And because of that, you know, you, you have to take that further on and say, okay, hey, listen, you know, if I'm watching something, what ads are being produced? Uh, it, it, the, there is a money aspect to it. Capitalism is never going to go away in America. At least I don't think so. Uh, if so, I think it would cease to be America. But because of that, uh, you do have to engage. You can't disengage and you can't call you know, small town papers, rags, and, you know, you, you can't just switch the station if it's a show you like, engage, email, participate, call. Uh, and it's the same way with, with society. You know, you want to be a citizen, participate. You know, I'm not forcing you to vote, but you do, you, you have to understand how government works. Uh, you don't have to understand every nook and cranny, but you do have to understand who the mayor is, <laughs> you know, who your district leaders are, and what are right who to contact uh, in order to get something done. And if not, guess who you do? Just contact the local paper because that's what people did to us. Hey, can you help me? We sure can because that's why we're here. That's why we're here. We're that glue in society that holds it together, right? Freedom of the press. We're here. We're here to help you actually navigate, you know, I'm going to say the big word, life, but... <laughs> Uh, and, and that's just, you know, that's optimistically thinking in the sense of what newspapers are, but we do inform you, we really do inform you, and we really want to do a good job, and when we don't, please contact us, 
you know, please tell us, hey, Terrence, that photo you did mm -mm, didn't work. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with this right here. You know, I took photos for uh, at one point. And when I took photos, I took I had I hit I took photos one day of a uh, put it to you like this a bunch of wily e. coyotes and they had been shot and dumped. And uh, it ran on one a real big, you know, a bunch of dead coyotes. And uh, it, it wasn't bloody, but it was done in such a way it wasn't wasn't that bad. But I got a letter the next day from a subscriber. And the way this lady eloquently uh, slapped me was, uh, was well worth it because she was like, you know, I don't subscribe to this paper to see dead animals when I wake up in the morning. And she had a point, and this, this was long before I was a newsroom leader, but she did have a point. And so uh, we rethought where we would place uh, photos like that. You know, they, it, it wasn't very gross, but it wasn't, you know, it was not really what you want to see in the morning. But I appreciated that because it showed that she was watching me. And we need that. Journalists need that because when you stop watching them, look, no one cares. And they'll bring in people who will write anything and could care less with no credibility. And it all just goes downhill, you know. All right. Thank you all so much for all of this conversation this evening and our audience for asking such lovely questions and thought provoking questions. I had one more question, but I feel like we've kind of talked about it already a little bit. Um, and that truth and journalism has kind of, has been a major theme for this series. And I think you've all touched on a little bit what that truth looks like for you. Um, so with that, does anyone have any parting words before we wrap up this evening? Thank you for having us. Of course, thank you all. Yep, thank you. Absolutely. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this is the final panel in the Democracy and Informed Citizen series. Uh, we talked a little bit about disinformation, misinformation, um, the importance of your local journalist. We, talked about those in our first couple of panels, Media Literacy 1 and 2. Uh, the Arkansas Advocate was featured in our first panel. Uh, if you would like to go back and watch that, Antoinette, she is one of their reporters. She gave some lovely insight to her work. Jess Deloche and Ellen Kreff were in that first panel. We had some next generation 18 to 35 year old journalists in our second panel who told, talked a lot about narrative bias, media framing, and that was, they're all on YouTube. Um, so if you wanna continue this conversation and listen in. Um, otherwise, everyone, I hope you have a great evening and thank you all for being here. It's been a great time. We've all learned a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm.